Ladies and, well, ladies, we're talking business. Ladies' business. No, not that ladies' business. Ladies in business. Especially tradey business. Whether you're a CEO, self-employed, working for someone or supporting someone else in theirs, this is a podcast about ladies in tradey businesses. Join your host, Nick Cox, one half of Tradies in Business and the Tradiepreneur Program, as she interviews inspirational, everyday, motivational and extraordinary women from all industries and walks of life about what it takes to be a truly successful, modern lady in business. Welcome back, ladies. Thank you very much for joining us again today. And joining us today, I'm super excited to be introducing you to a good friend of mine, Nikki Parkinson. Nikki is a former journalist who turned blogger. She's now an author, but more importantly, and what we're talking about today is Nikki's latest career, I guess, direction, and that is as a fashion designer. Nikki, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Oh, it's amazing to be here, Nick. We could just chat for hours, so I hope you've got a timer on this. <laughs> I'm not going to time it at all. We're just going to throw it all out there and see what happens. Nikki, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know lots and lots of my listeners know exactly who you are, but there will be the occasional one that gets to meet you for the first time. Uh, a bit about myself. So in a nutshell, I am a mum of adults and a teenager. That's two years to, we're counting down the two. No, that's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> no. You're in your similar situation. Counting down two years till semi-independent, mm. i.e. can take holidays outside of school holidays. Um, but I've had a lot of different careers the the major one was as a journalist for 20 years and I jumped out at 41 to start my own business that looks completely different now from Mm. what it was but it was it was weird if someone had told me that in my 30s that I would do that at 41 I would just go yeah sure I was really a very um have your job stick with it do that until it didn't work like it didn't fit in with the family um at that stage we were living on the sunshine coast and my husband started commuting to brisbane to a job down here Mm -hmm. and i realized that someone needed to be flexible and be around and it would and i'm someone who could easily get overwhelmed if i feel like i'm not doing the work part right not doing the family part right and the kids were late primary school, early high school and toddler. So Mm. you kind of, I I just realised that the only person at the bottom of this pile was going to be me. (laughs) So that motivated me to have a now or never moment and to jump out and start my own business that um, (sighs) morphed from a personal styling business into the online world because I just... I happened to be in the right place at the right time. 2008, social media was just kicking off. Um, People were talking about email lists and blogs and I set those up and whatever aspect of my business I do now goes back to those decisions Mm -hmm. Um, and the fact that I love a chat. So that community building side of things was, was the thing I felt was missing from my journalism days um journalism looks a lot different now like there is more interaction but it was very one-sided and it was more broadcasting Mm. um, back then and I realized with social media happening and that you could actually start a conversation that that was what lit me up and that gave me a connection to a community of women who were like me and 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 maybe they were making changes to their lives but they also kind of felt a bit lost in what that style, how they presented themselves to the world in in that era and their time. And so now I'm mid-50s and those same things are still things that affect me and I know a lot of women in our 40s and 50s, we're doing different things and we kind of need to catch up on our style um, and how that sits. We're not the same people we were. That's so true. I find I can remember having my first real crisis around my own identity and how I presented that to the world after I'd had my daughter because there's six years between my kids. So there was that first one. Then again, when I had after I had my son and then absolutely as you're identifying with each career change, there's been a, a morph of my personality and how I share that 
with the way I present myself. And at every stage, I stand here and scratch my head and think, I just don't even know how to represent this. And so you start to seek out, well, where do you find that knowledge? And you're absolutely right. Community is where it begins. And for me, that's how I came to be within your circle was through the community where it was comfortable and it was okay to ask questions. And it was right to be confused because everybody's actually confused. And I think it's another big part of community is the permission around being okay with not knowing. And I, I think until this point, I think history's really shifted over the last 10 years. It's really changed the space in where we are as women. We've stopped being frightened, I guess, of sharing our confusion or our lack of clarity around different parts of our personalities and who we are. And this is a big part of that. It's, it's communities like yours that are making it okay to share that misunderstanding or asking for help and knowledge within that community. So I, I really, I resonate with exactly what you're saying. I understand your journey. I understand how so many women find themselves within your community, trying to learn and understand how they've changed. It's a big part of why we wanted you on the show today, because as I was explaining to you before the show, we have a big community of women here uh, at Ladies in Business and Tradies in Business, and they identify with that confusion, I suppose, and just not knowing where to start with identifying their own personal style, particularly their work style and how they share that with the people around them. Do you have some hard and fast tips or some experience of your own that helped you, I guess, develop your own personal style? Yeah, I think the number one tip is to not get too worried that you don't know what your style is right now, because it it is something it, that's okay to say I'm not the person I was five years ago mm. um, and that might not reflect what's hanging in my wardrobe because mm. I think if you give yourself permission to be okay with that, that's allowing that change to happen. And then it is just a matter of realising you're not going to make mistakes, you're just going to play you're actually going to try different things. You're going to be inspired by different people. But at the same time, remembering that person isn't you or those people aren't you. I like what they're doing. Could that work for me? And if you find it kind of grating on you, I'd use the mirror test so much. If there's a spark in your eyes when you try something different, then that's probably a good indication that you're stepping in the right direction. Mm. If it feels like whatever you're putting on is overwhelming you and that's not even in the shape of it, it it's just it's not right for you whether that is a big bold color when you're more of a neutrals person. Um, don't force it just because mm. it's perfect for someone else doesn't mean it's right for you and I've always wanted women to respect the fact that you don't have to follow any rules or guidelines. You just have to actually go, is this me? Don't be afraid. If you like black and you love black, wear the black because that's mm -hmm. going to make you feel confident. If you can't walk out of the house without a riot of colour going on, then go to that and don't be sold into a neutrals palette. It is actually just about you and, and you'll get to know when you put the things on that are you, for you right now, you will feel a little bit taller, you'll have a spark in your eyes and you'll get what you need to get done for that day. Mm. And that's that comes with playing. I don't think there's a magic formula. I think there is just playing with it and being open to changing how you currently dress. If it doesn't feel right for you, if it feels right for you right now, then you don't have to change anything. Yeah, totally. We've come a long way from our... Um lip colour, matching our nail colour, matching our shoe <laughs> colour and our handbags, haven't we? I can remember doing department <laughs> classes as a teacher. And I use none of those. Well, that's not true. I don't use any of the fashion lessons that I learned then now. Now I dress very differently to the way I was taught back then. And I think it's a great um, understanding for all of us to know that the, the fashion rules aren't necessarily in place the way they used to be. You can wear clashing colours. You can wear clashing prints. You can have fun with what you're doing. And that's what it's meant to be. It's meant to be a reflection of what you feel like inside, I think, when it comes to your reflecting your personality. Um, I'm interested interested to understand though when it comes to workwear are there rules around what's correct and what isn't there's a general overall there's a generalization casualization I should say of 
even corporate workplaces. And a big part of that has been the last two years when so many more people are working from home. Mm. The only rules that will come into play are around workplace health and safety, Mm. I think, these days. Um, You will still find dress policies in some places, but um, hopefully we've moved a long way. Uh, There was a Brisbane corporate office that used to insist, and I'm talking even in the 2000s, not long ago, I hope they've stopped, that all female employees had to wear stockings. Oh, no. Like, even in summer. Oh, like, goodness. I th- hopefully we've moved a long way from that. Yes. Um, and I did see something on social media last night that Qantas um, flight attendants are campaigning to not have to wear stockings. So Me. let's see how we go. <laughs> so I feel like there's a, th- we've come a long way and there's an understanding that polished and professional doesn't have to be super corporate. Mm. Um, but I think the only rules and policies to abide by are workplace health and safety. So in a lot of cases where you would be talking to women who would go onto building sites, mm. I'd imagine. So footwear um, and high-vis vests, I'm guessing. Yes. Yeah, very fashionable. <laughs> yeah, very fashionable. <laughs> but that's a that's that's a safety practical thing yeah. to take into account. So they're the, they're your starting points, and the rest of it is what makes you feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, so I've worked from home for the majority of almost thirteen years in business. Um, so I was doing this a, a long time before <laughs> most of the <laughs> office population now, yes. and. For me, it was a transition from an office space as well, and it took a while to work out who who am I, but how also can I go from working, writing on my computer to going to have a meeting yes. with someone. So without having to completely change what you're wearing or completely be done up as if you're going to the office all day. And for me, comfort level is number one. So when you're sitting down a lot, I hate things digging in. Like I really, it's just, it's not comfortable. I know we're supposed to get up and we do and we have our drink breaks and toilet breaks and everything, but you just, you want that comfort factor because you don't want that interfering with whatever you've got to get get going on. Mm. Um, but then how do you, how do you dress comfortably, but then still professionally? And I feel like, the growth of the whole smart, casual, dress up, dress down fashion industry is born from this need. Like we want to look polished and put together, but we want to be able to change the look of what we're wearing by changing our clothes, maybe adding in a blazer or a second layer. Mm. Um, sorry, changing our shoes. I said yes. the wrong thing there. Um, so it's changing, it, changing shoes and a bag and adding a uh, outer layer can take your outfit, even a basic T-shirt and jeans outfit, to something that would be very acceptable in most meeting mm. scenarios outside the house. Um, but I think if you start from that comfort level and you fill your wardrobe with more pieces that can be dressed up or down, mm. then you'll be able to change that without having to do a wholesale um, change of what you're wearing to go and do a meeting. Nikki, you talk a lot about the fundamentals and capsule wardrobes. Can you explain that principle to our listeners? Yeah, so one thing I, I, and all of this has come from me discovering it myself and, and why are things not working? And it was most evident when I left my job and probably wore just a lot of dresses to work maybe some separates, Mm -hmm. but I would find I had a wardrobe full of lovely clothes, but seemingly nothing to wear. And and that is common with so many women. And when I broke it down, I realized that I'd just be seduced by, oh, here's a lovely top. That's going to be nice. But I'd never really concentrated on the best pair of jeans for my body, the best pants or shorts to, skirts to wear with the tops. So the tops would sit there and not be worn, <laughs> so, which is just crazy. And that that's what got me down the path of going, well, 
the basics have to be covered off first. Yes. Like it's all very well to be seduced over here by the bright and shiny, sequiny, patterny lovelies. But if you've got nothing to wear those separates with, then it's a waste of money and you, and frustration because you wanted to look a certain way because of that top. And I'm using tops as a good example because when you think about it, how easy is it to buy a top and it makes mm, you feel good? Absolutely. But it doesn't it doesn't make you feel good if it doesn't if you can't wear it because at last I checked you've got to wear more than undies when you walk out the door. <laughs> so, so that's what led me down this path and you and covering off on the basics doesn't have to be boring. It is about opening up the rest of your wardrobe. So it is making it a mission to find the jeans that feel great on you. It's not about the latest trends. It's about what feels comfortable on you and what is going to work with most of your wardrobe. Jeans is a really good example, I think, mm -hmm. because apart from our super hot months, that they can, I find from pretty much April through to October, if you're stuck, jeans and a nice top is always going to work and get you through. <laughs> but make that mission to find the ones for you. And it yeah. might be you need to find the work pant. Mm. might be a more traditional work pant that works for you that you know that you can put any, most of your tops back with. Um, I also rely on the no-brainer, the black pants, the white top that you can put together, add a coloured blazer and just be good to go without really thinking about it. Mm. And the reason why I talk about this all the time is you just want to minimise the stress the morning stress of getting up, getting dressed, getting kids sorted, getting out the door just to come back in the door. <laughs> um, but you just want to minimise that morning rush because there's enough going on. Yeah. So it's 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 a bit on that pro policy that Steve Jobs he wore the same thing every every day to take one decision out of his many decisions he would have to make in a day. And I'm not subscribing to that, but I'm subscribing to the less is more, but have those things that work for you, have the basics and sure, have fun with what I call the show pony pieces, but have the basics in place first. And so at the start of every season, I say, guys, look in your wardrobe. What What's missing? You probably can't really, particularly as it cools down, you can't probably remember what you wore because mm. we've just come through a very long, hot summer. We're still in it. Um, you've got to look at those first and spend any of your budget on updating those things first before you get seduced by by the new season fun bits and that's that's how I build a Monday to Friday wardrobe for mm -hmm. myself mm -hmm. um, and I encourage others to do it just to take that decision factor out of it um, and make it easy on yourself. I used to be really jealous of the guys because it, it just seemed so easy for them, really, really easy, until I figured out that they're basically doing the same thing that we should be doing anyway. They're taking one comfortable piece, jeans or shorts, and they're mixing it up with a different shirt. We can do the same thing. It can be that basic and easy. And yet we make it so complicated chasing after the show pony pieces, like you're saying, and instead yeah. taking those basics and layering either other pieces or some accessories. I love my earrings. I love necklaces, love scarves, because they can elevate a really basic and plain look by adding one piece. And then it doesn't matter whether I'm sitting here at home in my office or I'm popping out, because you can only see the top of me anyway. Nobody can see that nine days uh, out of 10. I've got shorts on pants. today. <laughs> I, have, I have denim shorts on. I'm going to stand up to prove this is the policy. Comfy. Love it, love it. Like a business up top. But I'm, it's hot. Like I've got the aircon in the room. Yes. And I mean, I, I, I could put on some nice sandals with this if I had to go out and do a meeting. Yes. In most situations at this time of year, I'd get away with it. But Absolutely. it is it is the comfort that put together. And, and yes, men have been doing this forever. They shop <laughs> twice a year. They just update. And, you know, now they're into party shirts. So that's another section. But it just goes back with the same pants that they might, they might wear to work. So it, uh, I say have fun with it. But if it's stressing you out, do make sure you've got the basics in place to bring the rest of your wardrobe to life. And the other thing I do most Sundays is actually 
put out my Monday to Friday outfits. You can put that in a different section to your wardrobe or I have a separate rack that I put it on. And I might change my mind during the week, but that 20 minutes spent then Mm -hmm. just takes away any kind of madness in the morning. And you've got a starting point. You've got that structure as a starting point. So while on surface, that might not look like a fun way to treat fashion, it's the Monday, the Friday we're talking about. So you want it to make you feel good, enable you to get on with your job. So if you organize that in advance, then you've got a better starting point each day of the week. Totally agree. I've adopted that since seeing you um, show that on social media and I love it. It's just one more thing I don't have to think about. My day starts at my desk at 7.30 every morning. Before 7.30, there's, you know, walking the dogs, feeding the kids, making lunches, getting everyone out of the house. I don't have time to think about it. And it means that I can show up every day put together without having to have taken that extra 10 to 15 minutes arguing with myself about what I was going to wear today. I've done all that on Sunday and it's ready to go Monday to Friday without any thought. It's a fantastic tip, particularly when you're in the trenches of being a business owner yes. and yes. working and taking care of your family. It's just one thing. It's It almost feels like an indulgence on a Sunday afternoon to spend an hour in my room on my own, planning out what I'm going to be wearing for the rest of the week. It feels really luxurious. It's, and I yeah. must admit, it's much easier now that my kids are adults like yours. Um, definitely would have been harder when they were little. But to carve out that little bit of time for yourself can mm. feel really luxurious and help set your frame for the week ahead so that you aren't feeling pressured and rushed running into every day as we so often do. Um, Nikki, we talked a bit there about the fundamental pieces and identifying you know, the right pair of jeans for you. How do you find the right pair of jeans for you? Is it just trial and error or are there... It's a- it's a lot of trial and error because everybody's are different and it and you can get lots of recommendations. I did a massive try on that people can search for on the blog from last year and a lot of those styles are probably still available. Mm. And but that's just my body in yeah. those jeans and the point of those kind of posts I still do on styling you is to show that just take the time and going into stores that specialize in jeans. I think if you can shop at places where that's their their thing, that is helpful, a bit like swimwear. I Mm -hmm. feel like swimwear companies are your best point for swimwear and and people that are dedicated to jeans. Not only will you get more of a range, you will actually um, more likely find people who are skilled in helping with your particular body type yes my hot tip whatever your body type is look for the elastane content in a gene <laughs> if it says 100 percent cotton <laughs> put it back put it back two percent elastane goes a long way yeah. to those comfort levels on your body and you don't feel like you want to rip them off as soon as you put them on um and that's easy. That should be, if you're shopping online, that should be evident mm. in the fabrication and the description. If it's not, then I'd probably move on anyway. Um, and if you shop, are shopping online, just shop with somewhere that has a good returns policy because you might want to try a couple of different sizes and you want to send them back, but the, the play with it, but make it a mission. It's the same with um, finding a bra, the bra that works for you. Mm. There are certain things in your wardrobe that it's worth taking the time because it's so easy to go, I've ordered those ones and jeans don't suit me because that pair didn't should suit me. Whereas there is a jean out there for everybody now. I would say in my youth there wasn't. I, I struggled with my particular body shape, but now there is. And things change dramatically once it was not your daughter's jeans that introduced that amazing stretch first mm-hmm. early well, mid 2000s that came to Australia I remember putting my first pair on and I've gone I've been waiting for these my entire life now that kind of fabrication is across a lot of brands and definitely <laughs> game changer but do make it a mission because half on about jeans but it does open up a lot of your wardrobe for sure yeah it really does and like you said earlier they can be worn in queensland almost every month of the year there's only probably two three yeah. months at a stretch where you really couldn't put them on if you tried yeah so wear yeah. jean shorts just wear denim shorts it's it's 
it's a happy medium in between the two. Nikki, um, I hear a lot and I've felt this myself, a great deal, a deal of fear in walking into a, a specialty store to find those genes. It can be real an uncomfortable experience, I think, for some. Do you have tips around how to get past that fear or whether it's just sucking it up and doing it anyway because the outcome is going to help you on a day-to-day -day basis? All of every woman I know comes with so many layers of BS about what we've been told about how we're supposed to look, what we're supposed to eat, what diet we're supposed to be on. And I think there are a couple of shopping experiences and I think jeans and swimsuits are one of two mm. of those mm. that it just brings, no matter how much work you're doing on yourself to feel positive about your body and they come, it just rises up to the surface and it, it, it hits you and it, and it questions everything that you've been trying to do to calm that inner critic. I feel like if you're really struggling the best bet would be to shop online. And I, I said this about swimsuits years ago as well. If it's a good return policy, shopping online in your own home is less intimidating. Mm -hmm. Like you're still going to have feelings when you put things on and look in the mirror, but you haven't got someone else that you're worried might say something yes. that's going to confirm those feelings. Um, and the other thing is if you want to go into the store, take a girlfriend or a sister who is really non-judgmental, helpful, that can kind of almost be an intermediary between you and the sales assistant. Mm, that's a great idea. And there are great sales assistants out there, but there are ones who, particularly if you're over a certain size or age, that you might not get the attention that you're hoping for. Yep, I totally agree with that. Yeah. On both fronts, I've had some fantastic sales assistants, though. They've been really helpful, really encouraging. They didn't lie. I don't like, you yes, know, the second they start like lying that. to me, I'm out. That's yeah. it. I'm sorry, I'm not purchasing from you today. But I have Give me some more options. Absolutely. And be yeah. constructive in what you're saying. You don't have yeah. to tell me it looks good if it doesn't. In fact, I'd prefer you didn't. Don't say anything yeah. at all. Let's go and grab yeah. something else off the rack and try again. But I think taking a girlfriend is just a fantastic idea to help boost the confidence levels. You're not alone. You're not feeling so isolated. It gives you the opportunity to get that critical feedback that you're probably looking for from somebody that you trust and potentially love because girlfriends are the best friends of all. Um, Nikki, I want to uh, look into the business side of what you've done because it's been an amazing journey that you've been on becoming <laughs> self-employed, doing your own thing, creating your own business, um, working so much, exposing yourself on social media. And I particularly think in the early days must have been so challenging all the way to where you are now with a magical label that's doing incredible things. Um, in fashion full stop. I mean, I just adore that you show your designs on every single size. You have a really diverse audience. You have diverse models. It's been an amazing journey that you're on, one that's far, far from over, I am sure. But can you give us a bit of a, a rundown on how that journey evolved over the time and perhaps a little insight into some of those key decisions that you had to make to take that next big giant leap that you took? Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to tell you I had a really concrete plan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and in some ways that has served me because, say, 13 years ago when this was all bubbling away about starting my own business, none of, none of this existed. Yes. I couldn't have had this conversation with you like this podcast. What's that? Like yep. it, there is just there's a lot to be said with having the plans but there's a lot to be said for being adaptable and flexible and everybody has seen that in the last two years and I would say every part of my journalism career set me up for the next chapter which was all the new technology that happened because I started and I, I love showing this I used to do some uni lecturing guest lecturing and I show a photo that was on the front page of the now Fraser Coast Chronicle on my first week at work. So I won the journalism prize for my year. So there's me front page, like how regional and local does that get? <laughs> and I've got, I'm, I'm at my desk and I've got a phone attached to my ear that has a cord attached <laughs> to yep. the phone and there's a typewriter. 
I've got a lot of hairspray and 80s magic going on. So I started literally on a typewriter. And in those 20 years of journalism, we went to computers and pagination and all these changes happened in the industry that I studied for. So that set me up for the next chapter, which was being open and adaptable to every new social media technology that became available. And I would see in my first career people who were just so closed off to any new change that was happening. For me, I never feared it. And I think that is something that maybe I have naturally, but also something I think is the greatest thing that people can work on because changing and things happening to us that we can't control are some of the biggest things that that we've all experienced over the last couple of years. And if you can, it doesn't take away how it affects you, but if you can move with it and get excited by changes that it that are happening to you, then I feel like that's the best um, piece that you can take. And really, that is how my business has evolved because I had no idea that my blog that I started to just share more information would become a source of income. Mm. I, I had no idea. And up until up until I started the label three years ago, that was the major source of income for me yeah. from 2012 to 2019 and it still is um I still have sponsorship agreements um I just don't take on as many anymore because the label takes up a lot of that and there would be conflict with working with other fashion brands in that capacity so no one could have predicted that let alone myself and no one could have predicted that um the blog feels like this beautiful lovely dinosaur that's still ticking away because we have all the shiny social media. But did Instagram stop or something last year or the year before? And I've gone, yay, go my blog, go my email list. I'm okay. (laughs) I can still communicate with everybody. Uh, But also the blog now, I might not put as much content on there, but it is still really good for long-form content that I Mm. couldn't hope to get across on social media, like the denim shorts edit I did, the jeans edit. That is stuff that people can go back to and search and find. And strangely, um, the most searchful things are some of the renos we've done around the home. (laughs) Totally different. People follow me for the fashion, but then the lifestyle stuff happens. And again, I can't explain all that on social media. And if I get questions daily about the decking that we use, I can send people to the blog post. So Mm. I don't believe anything becomes redundant. It just has a different use. And that's how I've approached every step of the business. Um, The label, goodness, starting a fashion label is crazy. Yes, it (laughs) is. I'm just going to put that out there. Or any product-based business, I would say, because there is so much guessing game involved in you've got to have the orders in for product, but am I going to have enough for people to buy? Am I going to have too much? And am I going to be left with a surplus? And you're making these orders, I'm making them six, probably six months in advance, which is only doable because we're made in Australia. It would be more if um, it was international but (laughs) even like I'll give you an example last year so six months before spring summer last year we all thought that the COVID situation there'll be no more lockdowns or anything like that (laughs) surprise (laughs) surprise and definitely did not know that our factory where everything was made would be in the red zone yeah. of the New South Wales Sydney lockdown area. So nothing that could have been predicted six months before. Um, and yesterday we launched our first collection for the year when a huge chunk of where I live, northern New South Wales, regional southeast Queensland, my old hometown, flooding, mm. disaster. Mm. It's just so hard to predict what situation you're going to be selling into. But there is a big reason why and also why add another fashion label to the mix. I've got a couple of key 
things. The biggest one would probably, I just want to shake up the industry. Um, I want to show that fashion can be shown on more than one body type mm-hmm. and that if we are a certain age or a certain size, that we can still buy labels that we're still happy for that that label still happy for my body to be seen in this label because there is so much bias out there, age and size. Um, there's some labels that really just don't even want you buying their clothes because you're not their look or their aesthetic, which is nuts in my books. So that's the number one reason why I will persist with this because I can only do so much, but I can hopefully inspire other labels to do Um, at least half what we do and you know it costs more to photograph on eight different sizes but I would say as an online only business we have that reflected in our sales Mm. and definitely get a chance to to rattle that cage secondly is I wanted to create clothes that women feel good in (laughs) like whether that's the fabrication, some of our some of our fabrics are easy care, easy wear, no brainer Monday to Fridays. Whether it's a linen that's beautiful and breathable, our t shirts are our best seller because how hard is it to find a t shirt in a good fabric that doesn't cling to your midsection? Mm-hmm. Hello. Um, things like that. It's it's those things that keep me going because the change and the help that we've been able to give to so more women through our own label has been incredible and yeah (laughs) otherwise it's madness it's madness it is madness starting any kind of business I think is a little you have to be a little kind of crazy (laughs) to want to jump in and start any kind of business but as you say (sighs) whether it's product based and having to take such a big gamble you can't be reactive in your business you're having to make predictions and that's super tough to do Mm -hmm. particularly where you get I can imagine it must be really challenging when you get an item that sells incredibly well it sells out quickly and everybody wants some and there's nothing you can do to get more through the door mm-hmm. because the well, we can months out often no not often sometimes we can because we're made in australia yeah we can if the fabric is available we can turn it around again in a month's time but have you lost the momentum mm. during that time and the excitement around it and people get really disappointed. They do. <laughs> they take it very personally. And I, I certainly understand. I understand that. On yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is. And really we purposely fun. do our marketing in advance, like we kind of pre-market. And that's not to make people more disappointed when something happens. We want people to get their sizing right when yes. they make the purchase. So we we want people to be able to check their measurements against any of our models and so that they're ready to buy and they're not – because the most disappointed would be not only – so you may, maybe you bought, I'm going to say, the sequin joggy pants because they were nuts last year. They will be back. Um, but Yay. maybe you maybe you got those. You got it and you got it and you checked out, but it was the wrong size because mm. we haven't given you the time to ask us. And, and I know a lot of – a lot of businesses don't offer that level of customer service, but we can't win on price. Mm. We're made in Australia. We're about quality over quantity, but we can win on customer service and we want people to ask questions. I feel like a lot of stores, and I'm I'm a consumer of other labels, it's it's almost like no one's there inviting us to ask questions mm. just to, to find out. And I feel like that is what we want to set people up for. But then if everything just sells out, then yes, it is. And as a people pleaser, I don't like that either. No, that would be super challenging. (laughs) I I imagine that um, manufacturing in Australia is super challenging as well. That's why so many of our big Australian brands go offshore to get their items made. Has that, was that a big decision to make in the first instance or was it something you were always going to do? So initially we were through our Australian manufacturers, we were manufacturing denim in China. Mm-hmm. Um, with COVID, we decided not to continue that and really just stick with Made in Australia. And a bit like what I was saying before, I've gone, I can make a good pair of jeans and people did love our jeans, but it's just one style. Mm. And I feel like I can leave that to the specialists. Yeah. And 
there's nothing wrong with niching yep. down and being respectful of what other brands can do in those spaces. And by sticking with Australian Made, apart from the New South Wales lockdowns last year, our supply is a lot and freight. Our supply and um, freight is a lot more efficient. Mm -hmm. I also, Ali, who I work with, is incredible and her team are so supportive. So the types of clothes we can do can be made here. Mm -hmm. I could make a lot more money going overseas. There's no doubt about that. Um, but do I want those stress levels when my goals are to make women feel good and to change the way fashion's marketing marketed? Mm. Um, I don't need a big empire to do that. I can do my small business. And I think that was a realisation last year that, I, and I can't remember, oh, scaling down is the new scaling up. It was an interview with the founders of, lovely you know the flower delivery yes. service yes and that came at just the right time for me and I've gone yes like I don't need to have this massive business like it's a very great business and a great turnover but I don't need to have that it's like people tell you if you start a business it's got to be mega yep why why does it have to be me? Mm. I don't think there's anything better than a heartfelt business, something that connects yeah. and resonates with you, then makes you more passionate about what you actually want to do. It was a great realisation for us yeah. um, here as well. With our building business, we went far too big. It wasn't enjoyable anymore. It took all the enjoyment out of it, took all of the freedom from our lives the whole reason we were in business out of what we did every day and so making that decision like you were just saying to downsize that and to make a choice now around really cautiously around the people that we work with in construction means that we have that job satisfaction every day instead of it just being a grind and part of going into a business I think for most of us is about something we were passionate about right in the very beginning whether it be being great at working with your hands or being really passionate about changing up an industry, about leading women to feel good in who they are in their own skin and having some layers outside of that that helps them make that sorry helps them to feel good rather than looking in the mirror and feeling upset every day that's a heartfelt business that's really important for your satisfaction levels every day as well as well as your community then because they all feel better about where they're at I think it's really important that we understand that there are businesses that need to be big there are sections of every industry that will we need that bulk turnover we need the big affordability for those companies to exist and then there are businesses that niche and take care of their consumer or their client and they're just as important and I think finding the balance and what's right for you has to be where it's at because at the end of the day as a business owner you're wearing the brunt of it all the time really mm. challenging Nikki and if you're not doing sorry, sorry. Go on. if you're not doing it for a, a lifestyle that that is good for you then yes. I'd question that too because again the last two years it what's important really <laughs> is our mental health and the people we spend time with and Absolutely. if 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 your business is not allowing you to have optimum in those two areas then yeah yeah it's, it's just yeah time for a change isn't it all right i've got two final business questions um your most favorite business tool or app hmm. trying you on the spot i would have to say Oh, favorite. <laughs> I was going to say Instagram. I would say, inst no, let's go, let's go wider. I would just say my phone is yeah. my tool. Like I literally can do my entire business on my phone now. Like there's all the messages <laughs> that I've missed while I've been on the phone and, and notifications. But um, that is that wasn't available to me when I started my business. Mm. I, the smartphones hadn't, no, I think my first smartphone was a Blackberry, but definitely from taking photos, I could upload products to, to my Shopify store mm -hmm. via the phone. So as far as a tool goes, and then I would say Instagram as an app because the shopping function, the way that we've been able to build a community there 
both styling you the label and styling you, that has become increasingly a way for us to connect with people. Yes, you're at the mercy of all the algorithms that happen, but it probably has still got the most cut through of our social platforms Mm. at the moment. I'm a big fan of Instagram, as I'm sure you know. Now, my <laughs> final question today is another curly one. I probably should have warned you so you had a bit of thinking time, but it's about those business lessons that we have during our, I guess, business career. We all, for me, the biggest lessons have been where I've made a mistake and I had to really quickly learn a lesson to do something a different way or to somehow make a change so that that mistake didn't happen again. But it's not like that for everyone. Sometimes they come across a lesson through um, an experience they've had or somebody else that they've spoken to that have shared it, which is why we do ask it on the podcast. I'm keen to hear about your, I guess, maybe not your best business lesson, but the business lesson you think had the most value that you could share with our listeners today. I think it's a combination of two of the things we've already talked about. It's that being being adaptable and remembering that you are adaptable. Mm. Like it is a trait that I have. And when, when things look impossible, that I sit down and I am active about it. I don't sit there and not move and I remind myself that you can move forward you don't know what that looks like yet but you have that way forward and that's something that has definitely worked for me over the last couple of years and it's something that I've reflected back on my whole career that's what I have done Mm. and also that if, if if you don't feel that that's how you are that it's great to get coaching on it and to to understand that we don't even need big pandemics to get into the way of of our flow in a business or life but maybe it's something that's stopping you from thinking that you can that you can move forward and solve problems Mm -hmm. um so i think that that is my biggest lesson that i've learned about myself and that it, that helps me to then put into place when little things and big things just don't go the way that you wanted to. Like we had an example only two weeks ago, our photo shoot samples for our first photo shoot of the year went AWOL. Um, and I went, okay, what's our solution here? Mm. And we had one, which was great. <laughs> involved more work and ultimately it's cost us a bit more money but we had one and I can't I could get angry and I could do anything about the freight company I can't do anything about the freight company because I don't care (laughs) but it um they showed up the day after the shoot Mm. so if what I I had to channel everything into solving it and not the anger of the situation that was out of my control Mm. at that point. So it doesn't always go that well. And my mental health has been severely challenged, particularly in 2020. Um, I experienced anxiety for the first time, but I have an amazing psychologist who I see for maintenance now. I've graduated to maintenance and, and I'm kicking myself that I really didn't unpack a lot of stuff in my early years to understand why I might behave in certain situations or react in certain situations the way I do and there was a lot to unpack (laughs) but (laughs) but, you know that she said it's never too late she's she's had an 80 year old woman sit down with her for the first time and start unpacking things and I'm and I don't know why I never pursued that and I I would encourage people to not wait until you're almost rocking in the corner to get professional help so, yeah, those two things over the last two years have really been helpful to me. Um, I totally agree. Um, my psychologist is a very good friend now and I, I actually don't know how I would do life without a regular catch-up just to 
I guess it's also a great reminder of what you have already worked on because we tend to fall back into those old neural pathways and behave the way we always did before. So it's a great reminder that, hey, you've made some different choices around this. You don't need to do that anymore. I think that that's the... Um, it's the biggest advantage I feel the next generation have is that availability to that support system. Yeah. Whereas I feel very much until maybe 10, 15 years ago, it wasn't so accepted and spoken about. So some big changes there, I think, for all of us has been absolutely fantastic. And what courage must it have taken for an 80-year-old to go and see a psychologist? That is phenomenal. I really, more power to that lady. Yeah, that's yeah sure. Absolutely. Nikki, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Can you tell our listeners where they can find you, um, particularly on, on the gram? Come and find me. We love the gram. So <clears throat> I hang out at Styling You and Styling You the label mm-hmm. on Instagram. And we're pretty responsive there. We, I'm usually on it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then any of the blog posts that we've talked about are searchable if you type in Jean's Edit Styling You, but you might also find those links in our bio. But if you go to the Styling You blog, those um, topics that we talked about are covered and easily Google Googled. I really encourage you to go and check out Nikki's label. I love the latest drop. The colours are beautiful. And those ladies that I was speaking to earlier this week, um, you'll know who you are. You're going to love Nikki's latest drop. It is just sensational. And I can speak for it. I, I own quite a few of Nikki's pieces. They're very comfortable, very wearable, very durable. They show up when I need them to show up. They're just fantastic pieces. So please take a moment to check those out. The, all the links will be in the show notes for you today. Nikki, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Nick. I've loved every minute. Thanks for listening to another episode of Ladies in Business. Got a guest you'd like us to interview? Maybe you have a story to share or some feedback to give. Find us on socials or drop us a message via the Tradies in Business website. Take care of yourself, ladies.